Brad, without further ado, I'm not going to do your bio, you know, your bio or anything like that. You get to tell us what you want to tell us. And thank you. We appreciate you being here. Sure, sure. So first, uh, thank you to Marie and Nicole for um, organizing this. I uh, want to give them a shout out. Applause for our hosts and, and the work they do to make this all possible. It wouldn't happen without them. So thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to uh, see a few familiar names and faces and excited to uh, share what I've got here. Um, if you know me, you, you probably know that I'm not going to let you sit back and look at slides the whole time. There'll be a little bit of interactivity here. So I hope most of you will dive in and enjoy that a little bit. Um, with that, I'm going to share a link in the Zoom chat here because uh, I'll be using a Miro board um, for the content and for a few little interactive things as we go. <clears throat> so I just shared that link there and invite you to join in. Uh, I'll give people a minute to maybe click on the link. I'm hoping that works to get you right in. All right, I'm seeing some names start to zoom in there. So looks like people are finding it. <clears throat> I'll kind of bring, bring folks to me. Maybe I'll do the screen share here now as well. So look at all those names zooming around the screen. Uh, let me hide those so we don't have to go dizzy seeing all those. Um, I'm assuming at this point, lots of people probably are familiar with Miro. However, if you're not, um, Really, the, the main thing that I want to point out here is um, there's two different modes on this left-hand toolbar. If your cursor looks like an arrow, then you're able to move things around and interact. If you click on that little arrow and your cursor is a hand, then you, if you hold things down, you'll just sort of navigate through this uh, little online whiteboard here. So. Uh, when we do the interactive parts, you're going to want to have that uh, arrow cursor so you can move things around. And if you get lost or stuck or whatever, or you have no idea what to do, um, give me a shout or, or send a chat message. I'll try to help out. All right. So here we go. Influencing without authority. Jedi mind tricks. Kind of a Star Wars fan. So always been kind of intrigued by this idea of the Jedi mind tricks. Um, so we'll have a little fun with that here. Uh, who am I? Brad Swanson, um, chief coach at Agility 11. Um, what I don't want to say about my background. So I'm a Colorado native. Um, I, my first Agile Denver meeting was actually in the early 2000s when this group was known as XP Denver. So that ages me a little bit. Um, I served as actually president and board member of Agile Denver for a number of years. Um, and a few of us at the time got this really crazy idea that, hey, we should have a conference here in Denver. How hard could that be? So we, uh, we pulled off the first uh, Mile High Agile in, in 2011. Uh, since then, other amazing people have taken over and, and really grown Agile Denver to uh, much more than it was when, when I was involved back then. So kudos to everyone like Marie and Nicole and board members who are doing great, great stuff. All right, enough about me. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of interactive things here to kick us off. So our, our theme is, is influence without authority. Um, and I'm going to do a, a series of essentially polls here. Um, so the first question I'm going to pose is, what do you think is a better first step in pitching your idea? So you have some idea you want to pitch, you want to get people on board. Um, over on the right and left sides of the little area here, I have these pens. So this is where you're going to want to have that arrow cursor because you can grab one of those and move it to one of these boxes. So if you think, oh, I want to start by explaining the problem, put your pen there. If you think, no, I want to I want to tell everybody my amazing solution and inspire them, then put your pen over there. See what you all think. <laughs> all 
All right, I'll maybe give it just a couple more seconds. I'm expecting not everyone will vote here, but we look like a we have a pretty strong majority, I would say. So let's let's do the big reveal. Are you all correct? Is the majority correct? So yes, the majority was correct here. And by the way, um, I'm leaning here on um, a guy named Adam Grant. Uh, the, the the specific content here for these first few comes from a, a podcast called Work Life that Adam Grant does. Um, so yeah, and and his podcast is not just based on opinions. Um, he he brings in the research. So in this case, we're talking research on say pitching a, a business idea or pitching some big idea. You wanna start by explaining the problem that needs to be solved. So the re research shows start there. You need to get people to care about the problem before they're going to care about whatever solution you are proposing. So problem first. So we got a pretty smart group of folks here. You all figured that one out. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, and I hope you're all able to follow along with me here. So, so let's say again, you're pitching your big idea. What's gonna be more persuasive, your passion, your energy, or is it preparedness? Nuts and bolts, facts and figures. What do y'all think? We got a little more controversy on this one. Maybe this one's not so easy of an answer. Ooh, it looks like maybe a maybe a leaning slightly towards the passion here. Um, I see somebody put one right in the middle. Oh, it's somebody. Somebody's clicking on my box and that's making it transparent. I'm gonna have to look at that. We got people here who are cheating. Oh, I'm gonna have to use the lock controls next time around. All right, so turns out this context of pitching your, your big idea, like a business plan, preparedness, it turns out. Again, this is based on some research. You can see the, the summary there, study of 1400 pitches. Um, founders who were overly joyful and passionate were less likely to get funded than those who came in more with the, the plan, the preparedness, showing that they had done their homework. I don't, I don't think that means you can't be passionate, but just passion alone maybe is not enough to, to bring people along. So maybe that's representing the pin in the middle here. I'm curious, uh, somebody, I think, I assume, deliberately placed it there. Anybody want to speak to that, your, what your thinking was around that? I'll own it, Brad. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't decide. I was like, it depends on the situation. So yeah. I punted. All right. Yeah, I think, again, the message here is you need more than just passion. you gotta got to show that you've done your homework if you wanna get people to sign on and lay some money down on, on your big idea. All right, try a third one here. So you wanna get people on board, helping you to implement your great idea. What's more important here, your confidence and capability or how receptive you are to collaboration? All right, we're, we're seeing a majority over there on the right side. We are getting some votes for, for confidence on somebody's splitting it down the middle again. Taking the easy way out. All right, let's see what the research showed here. So it turns out <clears throat> receptiveness to collaboration. Now, once again here, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be confident, but the risk here is if it's all about confidence, you can easily come across as being arrogant, um, overconfident, 
People might not want to join forces with you and be part of your big idea if they get that impression. So they want to see that you're open to collaboration because if I'm going to help you out, I want to know that you're going to listen to me and consider what I have to, to add to the equation as well, not just that you know all the answers already. Um, one specific bit of advice here is um, sure, talk about how you're qualified to, to take this idea on or lead this initiative and show some humility. Talk about what you don't know yet. What are you uncertain about? What kind of things have you already learned from earlier mistakes? Show people that uh, you are learning, that you have learned. You don't know all the answers yet. If you had all the answers, probably wouldn't need other people to help you out. All right, thanks everyone for playing along there. Um, let's see, I'm gonna oop, move us forward here. Um, so I'm leaning heavily on Adam Grant here, but this time not the podcast, but a great book by Adam Grant called Think Again. Um, and yeah, he shared here some research that has been done on the best negotiators. Uh, in particular, negotiators that are negotiating big, big old things like uh, labor contracts and things like that. So what can we learn from the people who are best at negotiating? All right, so first thing, finding common ground. So the interesting thing in this research is the researchers looked at a whole bunch of negotiators and they figured out who is who had been most successful in these big negotiations versus kind of the average negotiator. And they compared what distinguished those best negotiators. Um, and finding common ground here was a big distinguishing point. So negotiators prepare for how they're gonna negotiate or try to influence people. Um, the average negotiators, as it says here, they, they devoted only 11% of their planning process to finding the common ground with the opposite side. But the best negotiators, 38%, so about three times as much of their thought process and their preparation was how do I find common ground with the other side? Uh, and then they were prepared to emphasize that common ground when they went into the negotiations. So start with what we can agree on. This ties back into our very first poll that I did. We've got to help people uh, understand the problem itself. If we can at least agree that we, we both see there as a problem, then we have a potential way forward. So find that common ground. Um, by the way here, uh, if you have a question, feel free to post it in chat or raise a hand. Uh, and chime in if you need to as well. All right, what else have we learned from the best negotiators? All right, so if you're, you're trying to make your pitch, you're trying to persuade and tell people why they should buy into your idea, turns out that the best way to do that is to give only a few strong arguments. Don't give people 10 or 12 reasons why you've got such a great idea. It turns out that the weak arguments actually dilute your strong arguments. As soon as you give a weak argument, people say, oh, well, that's nonsense. So I don't think I believe anything that's being said here. I'm just gonna kind of throw the whole thing in the garbage bin. So stick with your, your strongest argument or just a couple of strong arguments. Don't try to pile on here. All right, next one. Um, to, to demonstrate this, um, there's an interesting case study that actually Adam Grant did himself. Adam Grant, by the way, is an organizational psychologist um, and a lot of good work he's done, but uh, he, he created a study, a little test uh, to, to try out this idea. So they're trying to um, convince people to donate to a university. And they tried a few different ways to pitch that. And the first pitch, they said, we want you to donate because it's going to help others. It's going to help students. It's going to help faculty and staff 
um, you'll be doing good for other people. And the result of that pitch was kind of stingy donors. Only 6.5% of the, of the people they, they tried to pitch here actually donated. So in a separate group, they tried a different pitch. So the second pitch was donate because you'll feel better about yourself. So in, in this case, we weren't talking about how you're going to help others, but you'll feel good if you donate. Interestingly, same percentage, 6.5% of people donated in that case. Now, the kicker, what happens if we ask people to donate for both of those reasons? Because you're going to help others and help yourself. Guess what? Half as many people donated when we gave them two reasons to donate. I don't know about you all, but I find this kind of completely sh shocking and surprising. And uh, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the, the psychology there. Both of the reasons are there. If one of them would convince me, why is it that I'd be less likely if I have two reasons? Kind of crazy. Um, curious to see if anybody has any reaction to that. Maybe it, maybe it sounds a little hokey in the end. That's what I, I was just sitting there thinking, oh, you're going to donate to others and you're going to feel better about yourself. Oh, screw it. You know, I'll use it for Starbucks. <laughs> I don't know. Just sounds a little more hokey with both. I, yeah. the, the first thing I thought is that it creates a kind of cognitive dissonance um, because they're, the, I mean, they, they're the same. They're the same goal, but because one is other focused and one is you focused, it feels like you can't have both. Mm -hmm. So it might make people feel just weird. That was yep. the exact word that came into my mind too, is dissonance. It's like two things is like, do I feel the same about those two things? Is it confusing me? Yeah, I think going, going back to the, the logic here, if, if I'm inclined to donate because I want to help others, um, I might think, I might think, well, this isn't going to help me feel better. So now that I've seen that argument, hmm, again, do I believe the other one or vice versa? It's that maybe that same idea there. Again, the one argument appeals to me, the other one doesn't. And now I'm kind of dismissing both of them. Do you think it has to do, sorry, do you think it has to do with uh, the type of people? Like, I like to be um, a giving person. I'm a giving person. I don't want to admit that I'm narcissistic enough to um, uh, do it for myself. So there's narcissistic people who are like, for sure, I'm going to give because it'll make me feel better. I don't care about helping others. Now, maybe, so, I, I would say maybe, but assuming that they they designed this experiment well and they had the right sample size and it was, you know, truly randomized and whatever. If that was the case, then I would think, um, you know, one of the other two pitches would, would show that and would show lower numbers, right? But they're showing the same percentage. I don't know that I can explain it that way. And I'm wondering actually if those are possibly different percentages, six and a half percent would do it to help others, a different six and a half percent would do it to help themselves. They're not necessarily the same percentage. Yeah, and I, I yeah. guess what I was going to say is it may also be perspective um, whether people are actually looking at, do I need to be convinced of a reason why I should donate? Or are people looking at it from a different perspective of what are the reasons I shouldn't donate? And it may fall in, in similar line to either not wanting to um, be selfish in some way about oh, I shouldn't be feeling good about it or mm -hmm. feeling like it, you know donating to other people it's their problem yeah yeah it could be um so um interestingly again I I don't know all of the details behind the the survey design here and certainly mm -hmm. uh, there could be flaws in it assuming they did a good job of design and it was truly randomized and the sample size was right certainly would seem to indicate here that Two arguments together are worse than one argument. So stick to one good argument. All right. Let's uh, move forward. 
Another thing that we learned uh, or that the research showed about the best negotiators is that the best negotiators ask more questions. I'm, I'm guessing we might have a few people in here who may be coach types. Um, and so maybe this isn't too much of a surprise, but yeah, the, the more skilled negotiators asked about twice as many questions as the average negotiators. And, and the questions, what, what they can do if they're good questions is they help people to reach their own conclusions. So if I have a, a good, powerful question and people reach a conclusion on their own, they're going to be more convinced than if I make the statement, try to make the argument from my own perspective. So questions over statements, or at least more questions, more good questions can persuade people if you can get them to make their own conclusion. All right, I'm just curious, how many, how many folks on this call maybe raise a, a Zoom hand if you would consider yourself a a coach, an agile coach, or maybe a scrum master type coach. You know, coaching is, is a part of what you do. There's quite a few hands going up there. All right. So yeah, straight out of the coaching handbook, we know that asking powerful questions is, is a really important thing. All right. <clears throat> um, Something else I, that I've found valuable, this is not Adam Grant anymore. This is just my own observation and experience says, if I'm, if I'm trying to convince someone, persuade someone, that means some kind of a change. Um, if, I, if I frame that as a change, I'm less likely to bring someone along than if I propose an experiment, I wanna try something out in the hopes that it will help and make things better, but it might not. And if it doesn't, then we don't have to continue with the experiment. Um, I just noticed a couple hands up. I wasn't sure if that was left over from the last question or if people had questions. So it looks like Christina C, let me know if you have a question there. Okay, it looks like the hand went down. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. All right, so yeah, experiments over changes. We're more willing to accept the fact that, oh yeah, this isn't so threatening. It's just an experiment. We can learn from it. We can change course if we find out it doesn't, doesn't serve us the way that we hoped it would. All right, um, so next up, I've got kind of a summary of all of these things together in one place. I'll um, see if I can... I don't know how I bring everyone to follow me once again. Here, I'll do it that way. Um, here, I just wanted to get some wisdom from the crowd here. I'd love to have any of you share any insights or maybe an example of one of these. So for any of the ones listed here, feel free to grab one of the sticky notes. Here again, you'll, you'll want to make sure you have that arrow cursor, uh, not the hand, because you won't be able to do too much with the hand cursor. So anybody have an example of what one of these might look like or just an insight you wanna share? Ooh, we thought I saw one person jumping in there. Awesome. Devin looks like he's going to weigh in. Oh, maybe. I was actually, I was, this is Tatiana. I was going to add something. I'm, I find it really interesting because I'm in uh, a persuasive, uh, persuasive training with Stanford Graduate School of Business Online. And a lot of the themes are kind of intersecting and overlapping. And the last piece about um, proposing experiments versus requesting change, they actually found um, or they recommend that if you're trying to capture people's attention or really make them focus to use the word change. And it's probably also kind of the same reason you were mentioning is like, it is scary and it is big and it is a lot. And so people typically will perk up when you say the word change. Wow. So I just found that kind of interesting. Oh yeah, awesome. yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I can see how that might be. It is, does grab my attention more. Um, if somebody's asking for a change, it does feel permanent, maybe a little scarier, but yeah, maybe that, could 
maybe lead to a little more commitment or more seriousness around it, possibly. And I would say here, but uh, part, of, part of this is about influence without authority. It's kind of the title of my talk here. So if, I, if I've got the authority and I'm saying, hey, we're making this change and you better get on board with it, that might be that might be more effective in that case because I'm sort of not I'm not leaving it open for uh, debate. If I'm saying we are going to make the change, then yeah, maybe people would take it more seriously. So interesting to think about. Well, I love this. Somebody shared a great example of a powerful question. Why are we doing things this way? So many good, powerful questions out there. Another example of uh, how you might phrase an experiment. We've seen other teams try this. Maybe we could try it as well. Again, it's only an experiment. I learned once that why is the most powerful question, but with great power comes great responsibility. And if it can sound like you're tagging on to the end of it, you idiot, you have to be really careful with the why. Yeah. <laughs> why do you do it that way, you idiot? <laughs> Very true. Yeah, of why you have to be very careful with, um, you know, body language, tone of voice, mm -hmm. and wording, because a why can come across as you're challenging someone else. Yep. It's very, very true. There, you got to be very careful with how you word a why question. Sometimes you can convert it to a a what question, or a how question, that sometimes is sounds a little bit less less abrasive. I'm gonna have to redesign the table in the middle. You're actually not able to lock those things in Miro, unfortunately. So some people are accidentally clicking on that. By the way, if you ever do make a mistake here, you can use the, the familiar control Z to undo what you just did. If you did something by accident. Zoom in on a few a few of these here just to make them a little more visible. Here's somebody here talked about uh, being prepared, although our things are kind of out of alignment now. Um, being prepared can involve um, having a plan B. A plan B can be very useful. Let me see if I can manage to uh, grab this whole, these tables are finicky. I don't know how to, there we go. Oh, somebody else grabbed it. Dang it, here we go. Oh no, it's grabbing everything with it. I don't know what's going on here. Just rethink the table thing in Miro. That's not uh, not serving me well. I, I This is Donna Gardner. I think for some reason I have more control than I want. Uh, I can draw on on here. I don't know if you see that or not. Not not seeing drawings come and, through. And I can also move the board around. Does uh, that this do table in the middle is problematic? I'm learning because okay. um, I tried to lock other things, but tables for some reason it won't allow you to okay. lock those. So um, is every is everybody else seeing? Um, people's names and their uh, cursors just moving about all over the place. I'm, I'm getting yeah. busy. Um, I was seeing that on my mobile, like I'm on mobile uh -huh. and I'm struggling big time. So I'm just watching. Looking at, my, um, looking at my shared screen here on the top right menu bar, you can uh, click on this little uh, cursor looking thing and um, you can hide all those cursors zooming around the screen. 
Do you desktop. think that just works on desktop and not mobile? Possibly. I haven't tried that on mobile, so. Yeah, I got the mobile app and it doesn't have any of those icons and controls. Um, so mm, okay. I see all the names that she's talking about. All right. All right, maybe I'll jump over here to the right side. We'll look at some of the some of the yellow items that that people have written here. So engage others before you've solved the problem yourself. Uh, somebody wrote about no buy-in if you start with your own solution. And around that that overconfidence, and that might signal I don't need people's help. So why would people want to help me if, if I already have all the answers? Ooh, I love this little, um, this little comment here around facilitation, um, highlighting differences. That's a, that's a good one. Anyone want to maybe say a few more words about that? Maybe how you might do that or in a situation where that could be effective? So, so that one's mine. Um, whoever wrote the one to the right, I moved it up there. So it was with mine. I, there was stuff getting moved around. So I just, mm -hmm. these felt like a pair. So I wanted them to stay together. Um, so I, I do this during uh, the divergence part of a facilitation. Um, when you need to get people's differences of opinion out there because you want them to eventually come to convergence and you can't, you have to understand what people think and how they think differently before you can get there um i find that this is a thing to pass through though it's not a it's not a place to live so i i try really hard at that moment and and i get positive feedback about it a lot to just reassure people that it's okay if they disagree uh that that reassurance can be really important i did that with a group of senior leaders recently and like you can see everybody take a deep breath and and relax a little bit instead of gearing up for battle yeah. um but then once they've done that once they've taken that deep breath you can sometimes get them to start talking about the commonalities or the win-win or where are their mutual areas of interest all right awesome thank you erica i love that Excellent facilitation advice from a real pro there for sure. Some good examples over here of finding co common ground. What do we what do we all want to accomplish? What are the top things we agree on? Good stuff. I love this comment here. Be curious. Um, one of my favorite quotes. I don't know if it was the original source of it, but uh, and Ted Lasso, that was one of the quotes I. I held on to be curious, not judgmental. I think I wrote that earlier in the presentation, actually. Awesome. Great wisdom here in the group. Uh, I've learned something here about Miro. I need to not use a table for this layout in Miro because those tables are <clears throat> kind of problematic. So I'll, I'll redesign that one for sure. Thank you for sharing that learning with us. Yeah, yeah. I was just spread your, your table wisdom with all of us. Yeah, I, um, I was shocked to find after I created this whole table that I was not able to lock it. Um, let's see. Oh, no, that did say it locked. So maybe I can. Hmm. For some reason, I was not able to earlier. Maybe I'll just need to experiment with that a little more, speaking of the experiments that... Thank you for your understanding. All right, so awesome. It's always great to get some wisdom from the group here. I appreciate all your inputs. Um, I'm gonna move to our next section. A um, uh, couple different sources here. Um, one I'll acknowledge, another book, Designing Your New Work Life. It's a chapter in here about influence and they have this, this formula they actually give for what is influence. I've actually tweaked it here. In the book, they say it's the value contributed plus the recognition you get for that value. But actually, then when they describe it, um, I think they maybe weren't math geeks because 
I think it's more accurate to say it's value contributed multiplied times the recognition because if you contribute tons of value, but you get zero recognition for it, you probably don't have much influence. It's like the multiplier effect here might be a little more accurate. Nevertheless, I'll give, give them credit for the, the formula there. Um, so here are five sources of influence that you might be able to rely on. Relationships, rewards, expertise, vision or inspiration. And then finally, authority. I know the title was without authority, but we'll, we'll include it here. Um, here I want you to each reflect on, as it says here, which source of influence do you believe you use the most? So you can again grab one of these pens over here on the left and put it in the box that you think you use most. And then what do you think you should use more? Grab one of the little plus symbols on the right side and put that where you think you might want to leverage a different source more frequently. Yes, I should mention also under rewards, I have that little subtitle there. So um, this doesn't have to be like handing out cash gifts. It could be recognizing or acknowledging people for their contribution. All right, this is this is certainly interesting to see. We see a lot of uh, quite actually quite a an even spread there. A lot of green plus symbols kind of across across the board in all the categories. Um, anyone care to to chime in in one of these areas where you're thinking I should do more of that? Anybody have a specific uh, example of what that might look like or how you might? use more of that source of influence. Raise a hand if you're willing to chime in. I'll share. I'm, I'm shifting to a, a new team, a new organization and finding that the sort of the influence I had with relationships is no longer there. I'm building new relationships, which I think will be great. Uh, but now I'm really, you're really looking to me for some of my expertise and experience in agile frameworks. And so it's like, all right, <laughs> I got to bring more of that. Um, yeah. All right. Great example. Thanks, Molly. What else? I can, I can share one. Um, I'm very terrible at uh, recognizing people and, and giving them kudos, especially on a public setting. And as an engineering manager, I feel like I need to do more of those, especially to recognize the creative team that I manage and work with. Um, and it is very crucial for people to feel like they have been recognized of their hard work. Um, as much as I do that in my personal one-on-one -on -one settings, I don't do as much in a, in a public setting, which is more important, especially the rewards and recognition. Right. Yeah, I, I, I um, that resonates with me. I also have a hard time remembering. So I've actually given myself a weekly reminder um, to acknowledge someone. Um, so every week I think about who do I, who should I connect with? Who should I acknowledge? Who should I thank? Um, and, you know, one, one week, once per week isn't a huge number. Um, Doug Conant, great story here. Doug Conant, who was the CEO of the Campbell Soup Company for a decade, for 10 years. Um, he wrote five letters of appreciation every workday of his tenure 
for 10 years at Campbell Soup. And I'm not talking about a, a form letter email. These were like old fashioned paper letters that would show up in people's mailbox with his signature that would uh, acknowledge people and appreciate what they did. So this is the CEO of a you know, major billion dollar company, five letters of appreciation every day. He made that um, that important to him to, to share that, that kind of recognition. So my one, once per week doesn't sound so great, but it's a lot, lot better than zero per week. So that's what helps me. I need that reminder to pop up every week and tell me to do that. All right, anybody else there? Anyone else who wants to chime in? Some thoughts around how you might go about using one of these more effectively? I'd love I'd love to hear yes, from I, some guy. Go, go ahead. This is Donna. Um, the the area of expertise I think is is rather interesting, and this also um, ties in I think a lot to the um, communication patterns that that are different um, based on culture and background and gender um, uh, as as um, female in the tech industry for more years than I'd like to uh, admit to, um, I learned over time that I needed to express my experience, my expertise, um, my confidence, um, not in an you know overbearing way, but rather in a way where I'm not saying excuse me, sorry, I think, uh, would you like, you know, all those soft, soft phrases that, um, uh, quite frequently, you know, peppered my, um, my conversation, my communication, and being more assertive about mm -hmm. what I do know, and um, what, what I have learned. Uh, made it easier for me. Great. Well, thank you, Donna, for being willing to to share that. Yeah, um, I, I I do leadership coaching and training, and one of the things we cover in there is is balancing your your power style between being assertive and being accommodative. And one one of the things that comes up a lot is kind of this conundrum for for a lot of females actually that. Um, you got to be very careful if if you if you're too assertive as a female, you you can be perceived a lot differently than than a man who's being kind of equally assertive. So that's a, a tough spot to navigate for for a lot of women, probably especially in the tech space where we do have a pretty male dominated field in general. So definitely appreciate that. All right. Um, the authority. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if anyone who put a plus on the authority would be willing to speak because kind of the, the title of this was influencing without authority. Um, but some of us do have authority and might be good to exercise it sometimes. So anybody who put, put a plus there, you may be willing to talk about how you might exercise your authority in, in an effective way. Uh, sometimes in the past, uh, I get really friendly with people that I actually have authority over. And then when I actually have to exert that authority, they they get offended. And um, so kind of working on using those skills more effectively, I think. Great, great. I love that example. Yeah, good one. Thanks for sharing that one. Uh, I believe that was Devin. Right. I was actually going to mention something kind of like that, but on the opposite side where I feel like in that situation, when I've, I've gotten those relationships built and I have that trust, I've gained their trust when it comes time for me to exercise authority in my role. Um, then when I present it 
to like, you know what, there's going to be information that I have that I can't give the rest of the team. Um, but I need you guys to trust me. Um, and building that relationship ahead of time and being like, you know, uh, can you trust me on this? And, and that they also really, from, from previous experiences with me, understand or, or, or can see and know that, um, that I have their best interest mm -hmm. at heart and I'm not authoritative for the most part. I'm relational. Um, that that has actually helped. So, so building those relationships ahead of time actually then helps with the authority um, if you just kind of present it in the right way, like, like, I need you guys to trust me. Are you here with me, team? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, and I'm thinking back to some of the, the, the these, these tips we learned earlier. So in this case of leveraging your authority, in addition to first having those good relationships, one of the first things we looked at was, can you, can you explain the, the problem you're trying to solve? So is the authoritative person as opposed to coming in and saying, I'm going to do this, you might start with, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, in terms of explaining why you're using your authority or why you've made a certain decision, maybe one good argument is better than three or four arguments, perhaps, as well. Uh, finding that common ground with people uh, as well might be something you could leverage there. So even with authority, uh, if you have the ability to to use your authority, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be bought in or aligned with your decision as the authoritative person. So you might still want to use your influence along with your authority to get, get people to buy in. So uh, authority alone can only kind of take you so far, I would say. But definitely something that you can use in an appropriate situation. I just had an aha on something, Brad. Um, first of all, I heartily endorse uh, Adam Grant and that book, Think Again. And it's wonderful. And it's not just that he's a good uh, person to read. If you ever listen to him on his podcast or on other people's podcasts, he's extremely listenable. He's enjoyable to listen to. But the aha that I had was when he was on uh, another podcast that I like, it's called Hidden Brain. Uh, yeah. It's uh, by Shankar Vedantan. And, and what's really neat about him is at the end of his podcast, he does some gratitude thanking of people on his staff or that helped produce that episode or something about it. And I always enjoy it, not just because it's a feel good thing, but it gives me an extra view of his landscape of what he's dealing with. Yeah. And um, when you mix something like a strong argument with thanking somebody um, for doing something and you give a little reason why it was important uh, what they did, what you're also doing is giving another argument. You're giving another reason, not only uh, for what it is that you're, you're trying to do as an influencer, but you're... Um, you're also cementing a little bit of your authority that I know what this problem is and I know something about the why and I'm going to tell you it by thanking somebody else. So it's a lot of uh, interrelated things. There. So thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jim. Yeah. As a, as a side note, you might be aware, Jim. Um, so Shankar Vedantam did a, a spinoff podcast called My Unsung Hero, which is like these little short clips around just people who did amazing things that helped someone out. So kind of a, a lot, nice little inspiration. Usually they're like four minutes long or something. So they're pretty nice. All right. I had an unrelated aha uh -huh that I'd like to share because um, I put a plus in vision and I wasn't quite sure what I meant by it, but I knew it was a thing I needed a plus. So, um, but thinking about what's what I mean by vision and using that as a source of influence, I'm connecting it with some of the things you brought up here around um, describing the problem and then uh, in, instead of or uh, putting stronger emphasis on it than describing your fancy solution. 
And I think one of the challenges I have as a coach is that I am very relational and expertise based. I get told a lot that I'm a good teacher and that people always learn something when I'm hanging out with them. Um, but it doesn't always get people off the starting line. Uh, they it, it can create a little bit of a this is a really comfortable place and Erica is going to tell me everything I need to know so um, they, they don't necessarily do anything so I I'm putting together sorry I'm not being very articulate but I'm putting together that what I mean by vision is to describe the next current state rather than the solution to get there. And I think I can be a whole lot better at articulating possibilities or helping others articulate where they'd like to be. I think it's it's really motivating when you can get that to happen. Uh, so thank you for those pieces. It's a smaller aha uh -huh than Jim's, but um, it was a click for me. So thanks. Great. And, and I'm trying to see if I if I understood I think your key point there Eric I think I'm kind of babbling sorry sharing um what did you say the, the next did you say the next current state as opposed to the solution yeah I'm thinking of course of the continuous improvement kata uh and and defining that that next state that you want to get to and then having the the experiments along the way start to emerge as you keep that that target state in mind um and so I coach this all the time, but I try to get other people to articulate the vision. I think sometimes as a coach, we also need to have a perspective. And instead of that perspective being a solution that we walk people through, I think we can, we can carry a vision of, hey, this is what's possible. Uh, and, and then have conversations with people about how that aligns with their vision or not. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you for for that additional insight. All right. Um, so that's most of what I have. Um, I just shared in the chat some of those podcasts that that we had mentioned. Speaking of podcasts, here here's another one that's um, spot on with this topic. Um, I've been a guest on this podcast a couple of times, not on this particular episode, but it's a great example of, of influencing without authority. Um, in this case, uh, Travis, Travis Matthews, kind of a middle manager in a company where he doesn't have the authority to do everything that he'd like to do, but he shares kind of how he manages to navigate the waters kind of from the middle um, and use more of his influence to get things to happen. So Certainly, I encourage you to check out the Relearning Leadership podcast. I've got a, a URL to that specific episode down at the bottom there as well. All right, shameless plug here. Just uh, want to mention, I'm just about to kick off um, a fall practice program that uh, is part of uh, the Agile Leadership Journeys program and also is one half of the Scrum Alliance uh, Certified Agile Leadership Level 2 or Credential 2. Um, and starting next week, this is a great program with cohorts of leaders who go through this journey together of applying their influence and authority and leadership skills and developing it um, to help their, their organizations get better. So uh, reach out to me or... Um, can use this uh, discount code here, but sign up quick. Or we're starting next week. Um, I can maybe put this in the chat. Um, I'll be sharing the, the content here. However, I can share it with the, the meetup group as well. Um, and one final thing here. Um, I am scheduled to do this same talk as, a, as an online session at the Scrum Gathering uh, in, in Lisbon next month. And so I'd love it if anybody has feedback for me here, anything that you can suggest that would help me improve it next time I do this. Um, would love to hear your feedback. So if you want to grab a sticky note here and share a thought, or if you're brave enough to say something out loud, feel free to do that as well. So I was expecting sushi from DoorDash before this started. So Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't. 
then get the DoorDash coupons out to everyone ahead of time. <laughs> So Brad, I don't know if it's in your Miro board. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if this is um, useful, but I'm struck as I often am in these meetups that there's such a preponderance of coaches and scrum masters here that you, you get different answers than you would with, say, a group of leaders. Um, and I this exercise feels to me like uh, it might have a very different feel to it in a group of middle mid-level leaders or senior leaders can i ask in what way i'm just kind of curious uh well the authority would be a, a mm. more popular mm -hmm. choice right <laughs> just, okay. just as yeah. a a little thing and i i think and maybe i'm biased by the the folks i've been working with recently but very few of them, I'm sure, would say that they were relational influencers. It's not high on their list. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm just thinking about how I'm. I would be curious to see how it runs there, rather than with a bunch of coaches and scrum masters, because it it would be a different experience. Likely would, yeah. <clears throat> Good insights there. So, so if I can throw something out, Brad, you went, so, so you had a uh, calling out a lot of um, potential behaviors to do more or less of, which seems like something to, to, to have some takeaway and drew a lot of knowledge out of the crowd and then went on to what do you want to do more or less of? Um, I don't know if there's a strong way to connect some of those to really drive home. Like this is the thing you're taking away. You're walking out of this talk with, um, if there is, <laughs> sorry, I don't have a solution for you. I just have the problem statement. Uh, <laughs> but if there that's, is, that might. That's the first step in influencing we said, right? Is right. To agree on the problem. Yeah. No, great thought. I love that. Thanks, Daniel. I'll, uh, I will put some thought in how I might connect those and try to, we get to that concrete takeaway. So good advice. I, I had a similar thought about that. I think the prompt share an example or insight is a little mushy. Right. Um, maybe make it more directly about an, a behavior you do personally uh, yeah. and keep it nice and tight. Ooh, I love that. Um, I better write that down or, or ask you to write it down, Erica, before I forget. I'll, I'll put it in, in on the board. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Well, this has been awesome. Such a great group. I love all the interaction, the great ideas here. That'll help me next time I, I go through this. So version 2.0, hopefully will be a little bit better than version 1.0, but I hope it was still useful for all of you. Um, thank you for spending an evening with me here. Um, um, thank you very much, Brad. Really appreciate it. Um, it's very interactive and uh, learned a lot here and, and had flashbacks of my past at HP. So thanks for that. I won't sleep tonight, but um, it's pretty great. Um, this was awesome. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, lots, uh, lots going on up here. Yep. Yep. Lots to think about now. So appreciate it. And everybody else, thanks for joining us and thanks for the networking. We kind of really enjoyed that too. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care. Thank you. Good evening.